It seemed as if the Savior was dead. It seemed victory had been lost. But what if we rethink the resurrection? What if we reconsider the significance? What if we rediscover what we've lost? If we flip the script, if we start with the end, we'll see that at the resurrection, death ended and life began. When you start with the end, everything changes. The resurrection really is the hinge pin of our faith, that it's not anything else that our faith is based on. We're not here today, we're not worshiping today for any other reason except that Jesus, a, a, a historical figure in a, in a moment in time in history, was resurrected and rose from the grave. That's what we believe. It's not the teachings of Jesus even though he taught great things. It wasn't the miracles of Jesus, even though he did some incredible things. It was the resurrection of Jesus that is the foundation of our faith. And we just kind of took a, a, maybe an obvious approach to what that really means for us. And basically we said that, that things have to end for our faith to really begin. There, have, there has to be an ending for our faith to have a beginning. And it was the end of Jesus' life. It was the end of his work. And it seems obvious to us when we think about it. That, that those things had to happen in order for the resurrection to take place. He had to die in order for him to rise again, in order for us to have that foundation. And so things have to come to an end for our faith to begin. And it's interesting. So we've just applied that to different areas of our life, different struggles that we have when it comes to faith that we all share in common from time to time. And we said a couple of weeks ago that, that we have to come to an end, that if, that if we're going to, to figure this out, if we're gonna actually grow in our faith, then, then leaning into our own goodness has to end. We have to come to an end. We have to just learn that, that we can't do it ourselves, that it is not our faithfulness and our goodness and our ability that earns us anything. It doesn't make us right with God. And when we can begin to get that and let that really sink in and come to an end, then, then faith has a, has a real starting point in us. And then we said this, that last week, the terminal thinking has to end. And here's what we mean by that. We just said that there's seasons in life that, that, may, that feel a lot like you're just sitting around in an airport terminal with nowhere to go, no flight to catch, no connections. And it just feels like you're just waiting and waiting and waiting. And there's an eternity of delays and life isn't going the way you anticipated or the way, the way that you expected. And now you're 30, 35, 40, 45, 50 years old and things just haven't worked out for you. And we said that when, those, when, when, when that kind of thinking can come to an end, then faith has an opportunity to really begin in you. And so we talked about those things, but the, I, I think those things are great starting points as it relates to our faith, but it's not everything. Those are great starting points, but, but I think all of us at some point can, can kind of grasp and get to a point where we're okay, like we, we, we are willing to rest in God's grace and his goodness, and, and it's not about us, and it's not about what we can do, and maybe we're okay, like we, we've come to grips with that, that reality, and maybe even we, we trust and are confident that God is going to do some incredible things through our pain, through our difficulties, and through our seasons of waiting, and he's going to use us to minister to other people in their lives, and we've, we're okay with that. But I think there's, there's something more to it. Those, those are great starting points, but, but I think there's something that really grips us so often that, that causes us to, to waver a little bit. I want to talk about a, an area that, that I think we... That, that, definitely gets at the heart of who we are because when we're really thinking about faith when we really think about faith when we come to church and we, and we spend time here and we're around other people and you know we're listening to podcasts and we maybe read our bible some and we, we 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 get to this point where we have an idea that you know what i think my faith is actually supposed to affect my life it's not just faith at some point it's not just going through some routines it's not just well you know re singing some songs and going to church like I think at some point like it feels like that from the outside looking in sometimes it's just we're, we're just religious people but when you really get in and your faith begins to grow you realize oh my goodness this is a little bit scary 
This isn't quite what I thought. This is a little bit scarier than I anticipated. You, you maybe even feel a little intimidated. Anybody feel that way? Because you feel like, well, in order for my faith to actually grow and for my faith to be lived out and expressed in my daily life and in, in, in my relationships and my career, in order for that to happen, that, that sounds a little scary because I'm not sure I'm ready for that. You ever feel that way? You're just scared. It sounds intimidating. That sounds like something for like, you know, pastor people and preachers and people, you know, that are like vocational Christians. That's what, it's what it feels like sometimes. You know, surely that can't apply to me. Like, I know I'm supposed to have faith. I'm supposed to go to church and stuff. But I think we struggle, like at, at the end of the day, our real struggle and what really hinders so, so many, for, for so many of us, our faith really growing is fear. It's just fear. Fear grips us and it controls us. And I think there's reasons for that and that's what we're gonna get into today, but, but there's something in us that, that causes us to fear and we're just not real sure. There's kind of a conflict happening, but, but we're just not real sure what to do. We think, okay, so I'm supposed to grow in my faith and I'm supposed to mature in my faith and I'm supposed to be, you know, but gosh, does that mean that, that, that people are gonna expect things of me? That's kind of what we're, we're, we're scared of. Does that mean that they're gonna expect me to like go to church more than once a month or you know, once every other month? Is it, like, are they gonna expect me to start giving and serving at the church? Like that, you know, that scares me. I'm not sure I'm ready for that. Are they gonna expect me, like, are, do they really expect me to pray over all of my circumstances? Or, you know, what if they tr try to get me to pray out loud? I feel like I, I'm not ready for that. That scares me. I'm not sure I know enough. And we get around, we bump into people that, that are like really smart and they're super spiritual and they seem to have it all together and they, they know their Bible verses and they tweet them and they Instagram them and they Facebook them and they know them. And it just seems like, oh, they just really must be in God's word. And it, and it scares us to death because we're not sure we're ready for that. We're not sure we can handle it. And we're just, we're fearful. And, and, and that, that, that sense is just like, just, it scares us to death and it keeps us locked away. And we don't know what to do about it. And it's ultimately because of this, because we fear the realities of this world more than the next. I think that's, that's what it boils down to. We fear the realities of this world because it's not just, you know, do I know enough Bible verses or do I know, you know, do I go to church enough? But it's really, am I really applying my faith to my life? Like everything. A am I really doing that? H have I sensed that, you know, that I've really taken my, my faith and, I, and I've made it a, a, an integral part of my life because that's what scares them. Let's, let's just be real honest. I mean, the realities of this world are what really bug us most of the time, right? Because they're here, they're now, they're physical. We see them, we smell them, we sense them, we participate in them. I mean, that's where we really find our comfort and our security and our belonging, Right? is in our relationships with other people, in our jobs, our careers, our financial status, the financial health, our financial portfolio, the accumulation of our stuff. I mean, that's what we surround ourselves with and it feels good, like it's, like it's, it's what comforts us, it's what secures us. And so then anything that presses against that or threatens that is scary. And we're nervous that our faith might, might work against that. We're scared that our faith might actually fly in the face of or cause us to, to, to call into check some of, those, some of those comforts and some of the things that we find our security in. Isn't that true? I mean, we, we all struggle with that. And so ultimately, we resist faith in what is to come for the sake of what we have now. I, I mean, it's, it's what we do. It's, it's, it's kind of how we tend to lean. We resist even though we know it, we, can, we kind of struggle. We have this conflict in our mind, right? Because we, we said yes to Jesus, we got baptized and we started this walk of faith and maybe we're kind of comfortable with, with God's grace and not my goodness and we, we're happy about that and you know, God's gonna use my past and my difficulties and my problems in other people's lives. I'm, I'm good, that's passive. But this idea of actively Sharing my faith and growing in my faith and growing in my knowledge of God's word, that scares us. And we're not sure, but there's this conflict because we feel like we should. Shouldn't I be more, shouldn't I be excited about this? I'm not sure I should feel this way about faith. I'm not sure I should have this, this thing going on. I feel like I, I mean, this is the thing that I put my hope in, in what is next. And yet I'm scared about the what is now part. And it scares me. And I don't know what to do about that. 
and I'm fearful, and I'm scared. And you know what? Fear has a grip on you, and Satan's loving it. Satan's pretty happy about it because it keeps you right where you are, and it makes you ineffective, doesn't it? I mean, when our greatest insecurities creep into our lives and stifle our ability to move forward and grow in our faith, Satan's very content with that. He doesn't even have to wreck our lives completely. He just wants to keep you scared. You can't do that. You don't need to make that decision. You don't need to lose that job. You don't need to get rid of that boyfriend or that girlfriend. You don't need to ditch that group of friends in, in, for the sake of faith. That would be ridiculous. Nobody would do that. How silly. And the idea of living out our faith becomes, you know, creates this tension in our lives. And we don't know, don't, don't know what to do. And so I want to talk about that today. That passage of scripture we looked at last week, where Luke has recorded the, some of the last words of Jesus as being that he will make us witnesses, that, that, that you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and that you're going to be his witnesses. That's a scary thought. But there's, this is really an extension for, for the disciples. They, they knew what he was getting at, because this really was an extension of some teaching that Jesus had done much earlier in his ministry. When he was sending them out initially, but while he was still there, he was, did you know he did this? Like he sent his disciples out while he was still around, probably before they were fully prepared. Before they knew everything, even before they believed everything, he sent them out. He said go, but he gave them some warnings. And he wasn't just, this, this passage of scripture, we're gonna be in Matthew chapter 10. And it's the, the section we're gonna be in, actually when you read through it, because it's actually recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in different ways. But they all kind of record this, but they all kind of couch it in a sense that it's not just what's about to happen, like while I'm sending you out while I'm here. And it's not even just what's going to happen after I leave, but it's very possibly what's going to happen in the very distant future with all of my followers. And so it would apply to you and me as well. And this is what Jesus is saying. And so he's kind of initially saying, here's what the mission is. And then he's going to tell us how we can actually accomplish this. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, he says, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, to you and me. He says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. That sounds really enticing. Mm, that's so good, Jesus. Thank you for that encouragement. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. He's saying, look, don't be surprised when trouble comes. I think that's what he's saying. Don't be shocked. Like, I'm actually sending you out as sheep among wolves. Like, I'm not saying that trouble may come because I'm going to say, I'm actually sending you into the fire. I'm put, like, like, that's where you're being sent to. You're going to be in situations that you're not real comfortable with. You're going to be around people that you'd rather not be around. This is where you're going to be, and people are going to persecute you, and people are going to ridicule you, and they're going to press against your faith. So don't be surprised. When our culture and when our leadership and when our nation and when our country and when people push back against what you believe, don't be surprised about that. Don't be surprised that people are resistant to what you believe and to your faith. People aren't going to just be in love with the fact that you have faith in Jesus. Expect it. Don't be surprised, but you can be prepared. Be prepared. And so he's saying, be wise, be smart, eyes wide open. He's saying, don't shut your eyes and don't compromise. That kind of goes together. Don't shut your eyes. Be aware of your surroundings like a snake in the grass looking around. You're making sure he knows what's coming and being prepared. It's an, an interesting analogy. But I think we understand the idea, right? We just need to be ready and, and we need to know what people are thinking and why they think, why they think the way they do and why they live the way they live and what motivates people and why do they believe what they believe. We just need to be aware, be smart, be wise. But then at the same time, be as innocent as doves, be pure, be separate. Don't give people any reason to doubt you and what you believe and who you are. Don't give any reason. Be people of integrity. Be honest. Be real. Be open. That's who we need to be. And so I'm sending you out this way, and so I want you to be prepared. Expect it. Know it's coming. It's going to be difficult. I don't want you to think you're walking into this like it's going to be super easy. I just want you to know that up front. But I'm sending you out, and there's no sense of like, well, this is just for some. 
He's saying, my followers, my disciples, I'm, I'm sending you. I'm sending you out as witnesses. And he continues, be on your guard. You will be handed over. Listen to this. You will be handed over to the local councils. You will be flogged in the synagogues. And on my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as what? As witnesses to them and to the Gentiles, to everybody. This is going to happen. You can expect it. As a matter of fact, these, some, some of these events actually began to occur after Jesus left. We don't have any indication that, that these events took place during the time that Jesus was there when he sent them out initially. We have no indication of that. But definitely after he left the earth, they were handed over, they were arrested, they were flogged, they were beaten, even put to death for the sake of Jesus. And so be on your guard. Know it's coming. Be aware. He doesn't say be on your guard you know, so that you can avoid it. He's just saying it's coming. You need to be prepared because it's not going to be easy. Oh, well, didn't you say that, that you know, when I became a Christian that, that, that I was going to have life and have life abundantly because that didn't really sound like abundant life, does it? So maybe our definition of abundant life is wrong. Maybe we need to redefine what living abundantly means. Maybe it's really just living a life sold out to the faith that we have in spite of the dangers and in spite of fear. And so then he continues um, to explain himself, but we're going to jump to, to verse 26. In this little section here, there's, there's three statements, three do not fear or do not be afraid statements that Jesus uses here to describe what this looks like as you're sent out and as you're preparing yourself and as you are, are expectant, know these things are going to come your way. I'm sending you out and I want you to be smart, but I also want you to be really innocent and don't give, you know, I want you to be people, people of integrity. Don't lose your witness. I want you to have an opportunity to be a witness through the way that you live your life. But here's how you're going to do it. And this is where he starts. He says, so do not be afraid of them. Those that can harm you, those that can hurt you, those that are going to resist you, those that are going to ridicule you, those that are going to get in your way, those, the people that you would rather not be around, that you would rather avoid, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of them for there is nothing, listen to what he says, there is nothing concealed that will be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. Excuse me, nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roots. He's saying, look, God is already at work. This is God's mission. And everything that has been hidden up to this point in time, things that I have revealed to you in secret, they're going to now be made known to everyone every, to, and everybody everywhere. This is going to be available to all. What's, what, what once was, was hidden and undisclosed is now going to be disclosed to everyone. It's going to be available to everyone. Everyone's going to have the opportunity. So God's already at work doing that. He's already, I mean, this is the mission. This is the plan. But now there's the expectation that we're to participate in that mission. That's, that's the difference. The expectation is that we are to express it, to proclaim it from the rooftops, to yell it if we have to. And so don't be afraid. There's nothing to fear. I'm telling you, what, what you have received privately should be proclaimed publicly. That's what I want you to get. Don't, don't miss this. So there's really nothing to fear because this is what God's already doing. So you're just simply participating in what God's doing. And yes, that's the expectation. What you have received privately is to be expressed and proclaimed and shared publicly. Don't be afraid. The word afraid um, is phobeo in the Greek. That's the word that's, that's translated, do not be afraid or do not fear. And it's where we get our English word phobia. And he's saying, don't, don't be getting no faith of phobia. That's what he's saying. No, 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 don't be faith phobic. Don't be so scared. Because that's just the opposite of faith. Fear is the opposite of faith, is it not? I mean, it is the very contradiction of faith. It is. To be so scared that, that we don't move. To be so scared that, that, that things are going to happen to us or that, that life isn't going to work out the way we thought or, or you know, well, what if I make this, this decision that seems so crazy to the world? Like, that doesn't make any sense. I've got all this debt. 
I've got family, I've got, I've got this demanding job, I've got, I've got kids to think about, I've got hopes and dreams of what I want to see happen in the future. I, I, can't, I can't do this. And so we, we allow fear to get in the way of a potential opportunity for faith to be expressed and to be a witness and to shout it from the rooftops. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. You may, you may be familiar with this passage. Rather be afraid of the one, and this is the real key, rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Don't be afraid of man. Don't be afraid of what might could happen in this physical life in the here and now. Don't be afraid. Don't fear. Don't allow your phobia to get in the way. Instead, replace it with a reverence and an awe and a respect and an honor for your heavenly father. The one who can control your eternity. The one who gives you your salvation and your righteousness. The one who has made you right with him. The one who loves and cares for you so much and even continues and says this. I mean, this is kind of the logic. Are, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? I mean, I mean, such a worthless little thing. I mean, they're, they're, they're almost worthless. Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. God is that aware of even the most invaluable thing that you can imagine. I mean, it's, it's worth nothing. I mean, you, you can get it for nothing. And yet God is aware when even that sparrow falls. Isn't that interesting? And even the very hairs of your head are, are all numbered. He knows you. In other words, he knows what your needs are. He's always aware, no matter how small or significant you feel. He knows what your needs are. He cares for you. And he knows you inside and out because he made you. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. So don't be afraid. Those three statements, don't, don't be afraid. Because you're worth more than that. Because, because the God who is in heaven knows you intimately, loves you completely, and so you have no room for fear. There really is no room for fear. I mean, does it make any sense? I mean, because when we really think about that, we say, well, I believe that. You know, I've heard that before. I believe that. But do we live it? Do we live this way? Or have we allowed fear of man to rise above our fear of God? Because you see, the fear of man and the fear of God cannot coexist. Do we, do we get that? It, it, they, they don't go together. You can't fear both God and man. We, we just can't. As a matter of fact, it's, it's, a, it's a sign of disrespect and a lack of concern and a lack of fear for God to fear man at all and to fear anything in this life. It doesn't mean there aren't things to be afraid of, but to allow it to cause us to fear and to stifle us and to keep us from action and to keep us from doing the very thing that we're called to do is a sign of disrespect for our Heavenly Father. They can't coexist. We, we feel like they can. Oh, well, it's fine. I mean, I can, be a, I can be a Christian and I can, you know, love Jesus and, and serve in the church and, and yet still make all of my decisions and live all of my life without any regard for what He might have for me in this life. There's a sense of that, and you see that. It's pervasive in the church, and I think it's why we look so hypocritical to people from the outside looking in, because they see people who say we have big faith, and yet it really looks like we have big fear. I hate that. I don't want that to control you. I don't want it to control me. You see, fear of what controls your present should be replaced with fear of the one who controls your future. That's, that is the key. If you want to know how to fight fear, get to know your heavenly father. If you want to know how to live a life of faith, know Jesus better. Know him more. Trust him more. This is what the disciples began to figure out after Jesus left the earth. Because he told them on more than one occasion that they are to be his witnesses and that they're not to fear. And they knew that. But they really didn't figure it out until Jesus left the earth. 
Matter of fact, just a few weeks later, some incredible things began to happen. I mean, literally in the same town where the events took place, around the same people who watched the crucifixion occur, his disciples in that location began to talk about a risen Savior. I mean, it was, and, and, and began to do some crazy stuff. One, one um, particular event that Luke records in, in Acts, the very beginning of Acts, is where Peter and John have gone and they've healed a man that everybody knew because he was there. He had been there, all, he had been lame since birth and he had, was always in the, in the courtyard. And so everybody knew who he was and they knew that he was lame and had never walked before. And yet Peter and John, they heal him through the name of Jesus and the power of Jesus. And everybody sees it and they're, they're, they can't believe it. They're, they're, they're amazed at what has happened. I mean, this is the same guy who we've, we've seen laying at the gate for all these years, and yet here he is, and he's walking, and he's among us, and people were, were going crazy about this. Well, of course, the religious leaders who had crucified Jesus weren't real excited about that, because, oh my goodness, you know, we thought we had cut the head off the snake, and yet here they go again, and so we've got to do something about it, and so they arrested them and threw them into, into jail, and it was like, oh, Jesus predicted this. He talked about this. Throw them in jail, and then the next morning, they they begin to question them and ask them, by whose name did you perform this miracle? And Peter and John respond, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's, that's who he did it by. Like it, this wasn't on us. This wasn't about us. I'm telling you, it was by the name of Jesus who you crucified just a few weeks ago. Remember that? Oh, we remember that. And listen to the response of these leaders. Chapter four, verse 13. When they saw the courage. I want you to hang on to that. It, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had what? Had been with Jesus. It doesn't say, well, when they, when they saw the faith of these guys, or when they saw the, the, the knowledge that these guys had, or when they saw the, the amount of scripture that these guys had memorized, or when they saw what their incredible track record in church attendance was. I mean, no, 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 it wasn't that at all. It was just, I, they just saw courage. Because, I mean, surely, you know, like the disciples and those early Christians, they didn't know what was going on yet. They didn't know what this was going to really look like. They didn't know that you're, you know, how long you're supposed to go to church and, you know, that it happens on Sundays and, you know, not Saturdays or maybe it's Saturday and not Sunday and is it an hour or is it an hour and a half or, you know, is it supposed to be, you know, ex exposition? Is it supposed to be, you know, exegetical type of preaching or is it supposed to be topical or is it like they didn't have these thoughts or, you know, is it small groups or Sunday school? You know, I don't know yet. Like they, they didn't have this figured out. They weren't as smart as we were. Or as we are. I mean, they, they just, you know, we know now. But they didn't. So what, what everybody was astonished by was their, their incredible courage in spite of all their fears. In spite of all their not knowingness. In spite of all the things that they still didn't have figured out or that they didn't understand. The only difference is they just knew they were with Jesus. They were confident because they had been with Jesus. And it turned heads and it caused people to want to, to question them and to know what they were about. And yet the religious leaders were like, oh, well, you're courageous and all, but we don't want you talking about this anymore, okay? And they told them, don't talk about it anymore. Then they called them in again, verse 18, and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Don't do it anymore. But listen to this response. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to him, you be the judges. Wait a minute. We're, we're more concerned about our God because we actually fear what he might could do to our eternity as opposed to what you might can do to our present. And so we're going to just leave it up to him. We're, we're going to do what we feel like he wants us to do, period. In spite of the imminent danger, in spite of the fact that literally you could put us to death right now because you did it to our leader just a few weeks ago, you could crucify us. You could cause us to go through the same misery and pain and death that he experienced. You could do that. 
But my goodness, why would we do that? When we fear our heavenly father, you be the judges. Who are we going to listen to? Him or you? To which we're going, well, of course. They're going to listen to God. Do we do this? Do we respond this way? When we're scared, when we're fearful, when we're uncertain, do we do this? And then to wrap it up, as for us, they said, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. We can't even help it. I don't even know what to do. I'm just telling you, I can't help it because I fear God this much and I fear you this much. And so I can't help but talk about him. I can't help but be a witness. I can't, I'm going to proclaim it on the rooftops. I know, like, they, Jesus warned us of this. Like, this was coming. It was to be expected. But he just told us, do not fear those who can kill the body but can't kill or destroy the soul and the body in hell. Just, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fear him. I'm going to choose to fear him. I, and, and as a result, I can't even help but talk about it. You ever met anybody like that? They're almost obnoxious. It's like, my goodness, and they're thinking, I just can't, I can't help it. I got to talk about it. You, that, that person that's like so excited about this life change that has happened in their life, and they're like, I have got to tell somebody. Something's going on here. It's crazy. Like, that, my life has changed. I can't even explain it. Well, do you know, uh, you know have you memorized any passages of Scripture yet, uh, young man? Oh, no, I, I haven't. Well, if you can uh, confess all of your known sins. Yeah, I've tried to. I've tried to think as many as I could, but I'm just telling you something's happening in me, and I'm aware of it. Jesus has done something, and I'm pr- he is present with me, and I've just got to, I've got to talk about it. You see, there is a correlation between your courage and your confidence in Jesus. There is a correlation between the courage that you have, in other words, your ending of faith, and your confidence in Jesus and who he is what he can do and will do in your life. You see, you can't be confident in Jesus and sing about him and not be courageous and bold in your faith. It doesn't even make sense. Does it mean that there aren't things to be aware of, to be prepared for, to be guarded about? Does it mean that there aren't going to be times that are difficult, that are scary, that you're not real sure what to do? No, it does not mean that. But it does mean that you can have faith and not fear in the midst of those circumstances because you're more confident in who Jesus is than you are in who you are. And that's exciting. So the question then is, why don't we do it? Why don't we live this way? Why is it so hard? Because I think, I, I mean, if we're being honest, like I think this is stuff that we know. I mean, you, you, if, if you've been in church for any amount of time or if you went to vacation Bible school when you're young, you know, you heard about, it. I'm supposed to talk about Jesus and share my testimony, even though I don't know what a testimony is, but I'm supposed to do that. I'm supposed to live my faith out. I'm supposed to trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. I mean, I have sung songs about that. And yet, why, why is it so hard? I I literally think it's because we we don't know God well enough to fear him as much as we fear man in this world. I really do. It's just a lack of knowing God. Of really knowing it's not just a it's not say you know a willingness to say I'm I'm not gonna fear anymore. Mm, I'm gonna trust. You know, that's not it. You won't trust what you don't know. You will certainly not live for what you aren't willing to die for either. You have to know him. The fear of man has to end so that the fear of God can begin. The fear of man has got to come to an end so that the fear of God can begin. And the only way that I know how that begins to happen is when you know him. It's like, well, how do I know him? Well, there are some things that have been made very readily available to you. And they're the most obvious things, but it's just communication with your heavenly father. Something that we don't take advantage of near enough. You know, we're so about, 
you know, what God has done in my life and this grace in my life that we forget that there now is a, a reciprocating part of the relationship where now you move in his direction It's not just him coming to you, but now you have received something and so now it's you coming to him. And if you want to know how to battle fear in your life, then begin to devote yourself to knowing who he is. Communicate with him. Prayer in the study of God's word. And I don't say that tritely. I mean, legitimately make that a passionate pursuit for you. I'm gonna know, like, I want to know this. I want to figure this out. I want to know that, that, that I can actually have so much courage that I can live out my faith and make some of the decisions that some of you are, are dealing with even now because you can't figure out how to quit that extra job. You can't figure out how to, you know, make those decisions that like might move you in the direction of ministry. You can't figure out to have, how to have those difficult conversations with your coworkers and with your peers because, you know, they seem to know more than you. There's like, well, there's atheists out there that know more about the Bible than I do. Then know more about the Bible. Study it, learn it, don't be, and that scares some of you. It's like, that scares me to death. What if I start trying to pray and you make me pray out loud? That scares me to death. What if you start telling, you know, I, what if I, I hadn't been to seminary, I don't know how to study the Bible. Like, look how big it is. There's lots of words and very few pictures, <laughs> right? It's scary. I mean, we fear, we fear the very thing that would eliminate fear. There are so many tools. I I would say if that's where you are, then you've not spent a lot of time looking because there are so many tools and resources available to you and me now that it's ridiculous. It's out there. There's really no no good reason. We even provide opportunities for you. We have a prayer team. Did you know that? And you don't even have to be a good prayer to be on the prayer team. We just want to know that you really love Jesus and that you want to pray and intercede on, on the behalf of other people. Like, there's an opportunity. You you don't have to be a scholar to do that. Did you know that we we pray once a week as a group of people? We've talked about it before. But there's like, you know, 15 of us, you know, on a rotating basis that show up together. And that's fine. Like, that doesn't bother me at all. I know 200, 300 people aren't going to show up. Unless I'm just, you know, I'm ready to be astonished by your courage. (laughs) But why not? What are you afraid of? Well, I'm afraid you might call me. No, we won't. We want you to actually enjoy it and to be comfortable with it. We want you to learn it because it's something you learn. It's not just for spiritual people. Did you know that? It's not, oh, well, that's just, you know, here, here's the thing. We actually feel like that, that, that fearing God more than fearing man is like this option that we have as Christians. Well, that's optional. Well, praying, you know, really digging into God's word, that's kind of like, That's for really committed Christians. I'm just a Christian. I think we say that without saying it sometimes. And yet we can. Don't be so scared. You don't have to be. There really is life in that. It is is not as, I I don't want to scare you off. Like I'm actually, I want to encourage you to pursue it. But you need to pursue it in order to not be scared about it. You really do. We have free Bibles available every single week. Did you know that? You can have one. If you've ever said, well, I don't have a good translation, you know, something with K's and J's and B's, and like, I don't know, like, I don't understand the these and the that. You, okay, get a new translation. It is okay. I know some of you have been taught that it's not okay, but it is okay. And we can have a discussion about that. If you're like, you're unsure. We can talk about it. And we have Bibles back there that are in good... A, a, it's an excellent translation, but in very understandable and readable language. Have one. We, we've eliminated that excuse. And the Version free Bible app on your phone eliminates the idea, well, I don't know how to read it or how to study it because there's hundreds, if not thousands now, of Bible plans and devotionals that you can jump on. And you can friend me on there. And then I get to see your activity <laughs> And you can see mine. And I don't mind it. Like, I want you to see that, hey, you know, I read my Bible occasionally. Because I want you to. I want to encourage you to, because you can. You can begin to do this. Just don't stop looking, because you've got to start growing. You can have a faith that overcomes your fear when you truly revere 
your heavenly father. You, every one of you in here, you can have an experience of faith that overcomes your fear, all of your fears, when you truly revere your heavenly father. That's where it begins. The fear of man has got to end. And the fear of God has got to begin. Would you bow your heads with me? For some of you, this has been, fear has been the very thing that has even kept you from stepping into that relationship at all. It just scares you to death. It's like, well, that's the thing. Like, I don't know that. I'm not ready for that. I'm not smart enough. I hadn't learned enough yet. And here's the thing, you don't have to. Because, wait, that's, that's about your goodness. And it's not about your goodness. That part ended, remember? It really is about God's grace in your life, what he has already accomplished for you, what you can receive now, and to begin to grow into in your life of faith. You can. Don't be fearful. You'll always be fearful of what you don't know. And I want you to know Jesus. If you want to know Jesus in that way, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I have been running and I've been fearful and I've been scared and I have allowed the things of this world to overcome me. And I have not allowed you to grow faith in me. And I don't want that to happen any longer. I recognize that you are my Savior and that you have freely offered me what I can't do myself. I definitely know without a doubt that I'm a sinner, that there is something broken inside of me that I can't fix. And I confess that And it is my heart's desire to receive what you have freely given. Would you grow my faith in you so that my fear of others would shrink and make my life a witness to your glory? And I pray this in the saving name of Jesus. Amen.